Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Editor's Forum on Growing Science and Technology Reporting in Africa. So, my name is Nick Ishmael Perkins, and I am a Technical Advisor in Development and Communication and Extension work with CABI. Um, but I'm really uh, very thrilled to be here because I think that um, we have a very unique opportunity um, this afternoon. It's the first time, actually, uh, that I am aware of having editors, as opposed to journalists, from mainstream media, as opposed to science-focused media, across Africa, as opposed to across the world, come together to talk about their reflections and experience of building scientific coverage for the continent. And we see this as quite a unique opportunity to address um, a policy and a funding audience um, and in the context of quite high level endorsement by the public sector. So we're really excited about what's gonna come out of the discussion. Um, and we're really thrilled that we've been able to pull together the panel that we have, as you'll hear in a minute, um, they have a really diverse experience um, and we have some very provocative questions and they're not inclined to be polite. So we're expecting actually um, quite a dynamic discussion. But what I'd like to do actually before we get into the substance of the discussion is to take a moment just to reflect actually on the event that's inspired the forum today. And this is something called SCRIPT, a program called SCRIPT, which is again dedicated to increasing the quantity and quality of science coverage in Africa. Um, but what I want to do is to take a moment quickly to invite um, two people just to explain a little bit about the context of this program. Um, so I'm going to first invite actually uh, Ben Dighton, who is the managing editor of SciEdNet, um, to just explain just very briefly um, what script is. Ben, welcome. Many thanks, Nick. Hi, everybody. So, um, it's just we launched script. Um, so, um, I just want to say a few words about it. Um, it's um, science is everywhere, and um, it can solve many of the problems that we face. Um, it can help climate change. It can help fall army worm can help with diseases, um, and also here at the Next Einstein Forum, we're hearing about science the whole time. So um, what we want is to, to get science out there, and that's what we're hoping Script can achieve. Um, and it's with the help of our funders, the Robert Bosch Foundation, it gives me great pleasure to announce today that we're officially launching Script now at this event, so this is it. Um, so Script is it's a training course. Um, the idea is to help scientists talk about their research in an intelligible way and to help journalists understand complex research papers, complex statistics in a way that can, be, can create compelling stories. Um, and so we hope that through Script we can inspire people to write about science, we can get the message of science out there. Um, and I also would like to just take this opportunity to thank uh, Sarah Hebbs and Charles Wendover. I'm not sure if they're actually here but uh, at the back for their efforts, so thanks guys, it's been excellent. Um, and then to hand over to um, Isabella Kessel from Bosch Foundation. Thanks Ben, thanks Nick. My name is Isabella Kessel, I'm from the Robert Bosch Foundation. Um, I'm very happy to, to, uh, to say welcome to this wonderful panel that we have put together. As some of the some of the leading representatives of the media in in Africa that we have assembled here, um, <clears throat> at the Robert Bosch Foundation, we uh, we pick up on social issues in the areas of health, education, international relations, and science. <clears throat> I'm sorry, my my voice is going. I caught a cold <laughs> yesterday. Um, the mission of the science department that I'm working at is to build bridges between science and society. Uh, one thing we have heard lots during the last two days, um, in order to find joint solutions for living together in the future. In this process, participation and active contribution of all parts of society is crucial for us. 
The science and research team focuses on three topics. It's the transformation, <clears throat> the transformation of urban and rural spaces. Secondly, the research for sustainability. And thirdly, networking and promotion of science. In the later, we're initiating dialogue between diverse audiences, foster scientific literacy, and support modern journalism. We have partnered up with Side of Net to build a, a Pan-African platform, as Ben described, uh, with free online courses for journalists and scientists. Journalists can improve their skills to report on science, and scientists can improve their skills to interact confidently with the media. We strongly believe that improved science communication leads to better decision making by individuals and governments. So we hope you enjoy the discussion. Um, and I will just say one thing. Take this flyer out into the world. Let everybody know that script is there. Um, tell your friends in journalism and science. Make them sign up and take courses. And if you're so inclined, you can also fill in this little survey that we've put out on the, on the seats uh, in order for us to make these events better. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Isabel. Thank you, Ben. I should mention, actually, I think I can now say this safely, Ben, can't I? That um, site of net uh, just today um, won an award from the International Society for Neglected Tropical Diseases for their coverage of the topic um, over the last year. So congratulations to you and the team. Um, okay, so you're probably thinking, okay, so there's this training course actually for journalists and for scientists um, for Africa. So you came up with a solution and then you thought, oh, maybe we can talk about what we should be doing. <laughs> but I think actually the way I understand the context of this is that actually the, the course and the online platform is very much going to be shaped by the people who use this. Um, they're a variety of partnering institutions um, across the continent. And uh, one of the, the, the key features of Script is the networking facility and the ability basically for users to shape and inform the content as it develops. Um, so this really is quite a crucial moment um, to start to engage from folks like the ones that we have here on the panel about the kinds of issues that we need to be live to if we want to address um, aspirations for the kind of contribution that science and technology can make to the public good in the way that we heard um, Julie describe it for the Bosch Foundation. Um, okay, so enough from me. Um, I, I want to start introducing our panel, and I'm, I'm going to start with uh, Julie Masiga, who is sitting right next to me. Masiga. Masiga. It's funny, actually. We talked about this just before, and I actually, yeah, no, I won't mess it up. I'll be good. Um, um, so Julie Masiga is the... Uh, Peace and Security Editor at The Conversation Africa. And I don't know how many of you have heard of The Conversation. It's um, a global publication um, that works with researchers across a variety of sectors. Um, and Julie works with them in Nairobi. Um, and she has vast experience in writing and editing for both newspapers and magazines in the East Africa region, uh, working with titles from The Nation, um, The Standard Group with East Africa magazines, and she also writes a weekly column for the Standard newspaper. Um, so Julie, um, I'd be very interested to hear your reflections on the state of science coverage in Africa. Um, right, I think it's, um, sorry, hi guys. <laughs> it's probably a global problem, and I think it's two-pronged. It's the fact it has to do with editors and audiences. On the part of editors, we haven't prioritized science reporting on the continent. It's still very much a niche. Um, area of reporting. It's not been mainstreamed and it competes with other stories that editors get more, that the editors privilege more. Um, sex, scandal politics, those kind of things, natural disasters. Um, health tends to be tucked away either in a magazine or somewhere after page 15 of the newspaper. So that's the editor's problem and not, in not trying to basically make health reporting a part of everyday life. Um, at least um, for example, if you think about the front page of the paper or headlines of a paper, you very rarely find health headlines unless something really big has happened. Uh, the second part of the problem is audiences. I think there's a perception that health coverage and health science, I mean, science reporting is boring. Uh, you really don't, something you, you're not necessarily interested in 
um, as opposed to other things like I say, sex scandal politics. Um, and there's also this perception, this is not even a perception, the reality is that when it bleeds, it leads. So stories which are more, we were talking about this yesterday, which are bad news, are more likely to be given, are more likely to be read than stories that are good news or stories about research and stuff like that. I'll give you one example before I move on. I know Nikki said I should keep it very short. In Kenya, we had a cholera outbreak, and it was really bad, and it affected uh, probably millions of people. But it wasn't until that cholera, the cholera outbreak affected guests in the deputy president's hotel that it became a mainstream story, because now it was linked to a high-profile um, personality, and he had all his other problems to do with him that were not brought into the story, but that's how health now was put at the forefront. So I think um, the state of our reporting, that would be the state in East Africa, and I, I believe around Africa, where we are not privileging health and science coverage and reporting, and perhaps we should be moving in that direction. Okay, thank you very much, Julie. I think there's a lot already in there that's worth uh, unpacking and discussing. I should let you know that we will have um, some time as well to hear your reflections in the audience because I'm sure that you yourselves will have various experiences and uh, opinions on, on some of the issues here. Um, okay, I want to move on to our next panelist, um, Idris Haruna, who is a uh, producer with Radio Nigeria Radio Broadcasting. Um, and he has been working actually in radio for over 20 years um, as a reporter, as an editor, as a program producer, and is currently actually part of the, the management um, at Radio Nigeria, and has worked in diverse fields from the environment to the economy to governance. Um, so, Idris, what is your experience of, of science coverage in Africa, and particularly how does it relate to what Julie has just said? Well, uh, first of all, I want to thank. Um Saidev for giving me the opportunity uh, to attend uh, the NEF forum. Uh, I used to pride myself as a, a very knowledgeable current affairs officer, but uh, until I had a meeting in Nairobi last in December, I never knew anything like NEF existed. Now, going back to uh, Nick's uh, question, I think uh, the first thing that maybe comes to mind is uh, training, because I look back See, about two decades ago, when I was in university, I attended, uh, I read mass communication, and I had little or very scant uh, coverage on, on anything on science and technology reporting. And uh, there was little or scant coverage of it. There was nothing on the curriculum saying the science and technology dep uh, reporting. So when reporters, uh, journalists go out into the field from the universities and from various state institutions, they know little or nothing about science and uh, technology reporting. So they usually easily go to the easy ones, the, uh, politics, economy, those are the uh, stories or the niches uh, that attract the attention of the people. So I think training of journalists after the beginning is key. Um, happily now, in the last decade or so, in the curriculum of many universities, you see courses called science and technology reporting. So I think if that is done on the long run, uh, journalists can be encouraged uh, to take uh, this as a bit, and a serious bit at that, and then maybe develop it into uh, other things. And the second aspect too is on the science of, the, on the part of the uh, scientists too. Uh, in Africa, uh, or in Nigeria in particular, there's little, uh, or, or they do not realize the importance of the media, of actually <coughs> partnering or collaborating with the media to tell Nigerians or the public what they're actually doing. Uh, there's a tendency to keep whatever they're doing into, in their laboratories and uh, in their offices and we do not realize that there's a need for the public to know what you're doing. So I think on both sides, from the journalist side and the, on the scientist side too, uh, there's a need for better collaboration, for them to realize that they can work together uh, to further the frontiers in uh, science and technology in Africa. Of interest, can I ask you a follow-up question very quickly? Yes. How many science stories do you have on the radio station a week? Uh, actually, when you talk of science, it is very rare, uh, except when you have, as she was talking about cholera outbreak, when we had the Ebola outbreak in West Africa and Nigeria, many science reports were every day, in fact, they led the bulletin every day. But once that had died down, uh, except you have outbreaks of uh, maybe diseases like uh, yellow fever, uh, cholera or lead poisoning. I think those are the eight times when you see uh, science reporting getting to the front burner of, uh, of the headlines. Otherwise, 
real science opportunities, sense that uh, maybe scientists conduct research, uh, come up with groundbreaking uh, innovations that should uh, get the media to really have uh, very little autonomy to the Nigerian media. Okay, very interesting again. Um, now I want to move on to David uh, Abuda, who is a, a, a Duda, who is the head of business development and partnership at uh, Nation Media Group, and the Nation Media Group is uh, the largest in East and Southern Africa. And David has trained journalists himself um, as, a, as a trainee editor, um, and he's held various editorial positions um, at, at the Nation Media Group over the last 15 years. And as part of his current portfolio, he's managing a project on health and science reporting. So, David, what are your reflections on the current state of, of science journalism in Africa? Um, thank you, Nick. I associate with my colleagues that um, the quantity and quality is still uh, working. But I must say that um, there's been recognition in many media houses. And in recent times, we are seeing blossoming coverage of these disciplines. Um, the National Media Group, where I work, now has a dedicated pullout every week on health and science, and also a dedicated um, broadcast segment once a week, plus daily news and many. But this has been possible through some support in terms of uh, external funding. So uh, we are beginning to see some increase in numbers. But underlying this, there are fundamental issues. One is that um, covering or writing about health and science is a process-oriented business. It's not easy. So quite often, many journalists run away from it. And again, um, doing a story requires a lot of resources, which means many companies are not uh, ready to put in a lot of their money to do one story. If, for example, you're doing a broadcast story, which will go on air for about uh, five uh, minutes. The amount of time and resources you put into it is enormous. Now that makes it difficult for many media houses to do that. So they run away from it. In as much as they recognize that it is an interesting or a very, very important subject of our news menu. Having said that, I've also from experience noted um, the disconnect between media practitioners, health, science, researchers, on the other side, with mutual mistrust, uh, with journalists saying that the researchers, edit, uh, researchers, scientists talk on their own. Uh, conversely, researchers, uh, scientists say that journalists don't understand their issues. So there's that mistrust which makes it difficult for journalists to get stories from the researchers, and conversely, for researchers, scientists, uh, to pitch their stories for the media. And I'm happy that uh, this week, starting Sunday, we had a conversation bringing together uh, media practitioners and those on the news generation con side, the scientists, researchers, and that group of people, so that we are beginning to create some linkages, which I would imagine will now culminate into more coverage of these issues. And lastly, this forum that we have here in Chigali is very important because it opens eyes of journalists to be able to see the various range of issues that they can write about. So they will not say that there are no stories because there are many things happening. And you can only get this showcased in a forum like this. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Now, I should just explain, uh, when David said that we started to have a conversation on Sunday, there was a workshop um, as a pre-event to the forum um, where I understand Saidev and uh, the Bosch Foundation had a workshop with uh, journalists and, um, and researchers attending NEF. Um, okay, now I would like to move on to um, Andy Meldrum, um, who has been a journalist in Africa for 33 years. He's traveled widely um, across the continent, um, covering a range of stories from Zimbabwe's transition, anti-apartheid struggle, and, um, and South Africa's democracy. And he's actually based in South Africa at the moment. Uh, where he's the acting Africa editor uh, for the Associated Press, which is one of the largest wire services in, in the world. Um, Andy, let me hear your reflections on the state of science journalism in Africa. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Nick. 
Um, first, I'd like to just uh, say that uh, I don't like to see science as science stories only. I mean, for the Associated Press, it's a mainstream uh, media organization, and so we're writing mainstream news stories. And I don't like to see science stories in a kind of ivory tower ghetto of science. I see science stories as news stories, and I treat them as such. Uh, and I also like to use science uh, in uh, uh, mainstream news stories to inform, to add substance to the story. For instance, if you're looking at the situation in, let's say, Mali, uh, then, uh, uh, and the situation is difficult, uh, and uh, because of Islamic extremism, and it's breaking down, what was already a kind of shaky situation, and how can you do, how can you you know really illustrate that well? Well, you can look at health indicators, and you can look at health indicators in the northern part of Mali, and actually uh, infant mortality in the past five years has gone way up. Uh, maternal mortality has gone way up. Why? Because the uh, violence uh, uh, in that area has forced the closure of many of the health clinics that were operating in uh, in northern Mali. So, uh, you know, as I say, if you, you know, I like to use uh, a good science to help add substance and, and, and to, our, to our, our news coverage. And on the other hand, uh, there are many science stories that become news stories. Ebola is a good example. Uh, and now we have a loss of fever, HIV, TB. These are all public health issues uh, that uh, we want to use good science to explain it. Uh, of course, what we do, uh, especially in editing, but also in reporting, is to, to make, to not have it be, as I say, in an ivory tower, uh, using words that people aren't quite sure uh, what they mean, but actually to translate that into easily understandable language. And also uh, to take the science, to take the reports of research, and to translate that into ordinary people's lives. In other words, can we find uh, a TB patient in South Africa and how his, uh, uh, his uh, strain of TB is resistant to drugs and how that's being battled and put it into uh, a, a, sto a personal story that people can understand. Um, I think that uh, science journalism can, you know, is seen a, can be seen as something that is not for the ordinary person when in fact science is part of all of our lives. Um, and so I am trying uh, to get uh, science journalism to be a narrative of uh, a, a compelling narrative that people will want to read and they can relate to it as part of their lives and, and the, 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 the community around them. Okay, very interesting. Um, and again, full of uh, observations that I think is worth uh, revisiting. Um, I'd like to now move on to Bothaina Osama, who is a founding member of the Arab Science Journalists Association. Bothaina was also the managing science editor at islamonline.net, it's an Arabic website for several years, and she is currently the regional coordinator for SciDevNet for the Middle East and North Africa edition. Bothaina, what are your reflections on the state of science journalism at large in the continent? Thank you, Nick. Um, actually, science journalism in North Africa started very early. Um, it started like 1798. Uh, uh, with a magazine called La Decade Egyptienne, while the France, France is uh, colonial on Egypt. But as science faced decades of, of neglection, so as science journalism, um, and as the science is coming back to be prioritized, um, also science journalism in the region is, is now have more uh, flourishing than it used to be. Uh, but I have to admit that um, in North Africa, we are facing um, very low numbers of, of science um, journalists or people who are dedicated uh, their career to science journalists. Um, for the coverage itself, I, I, I think I, I go ahead with um, what Andrew said, that um, the problem is not the audiences, as Julie said, I'm sorry, but um, because um, if you think that the audiences are not interested in what we are presenting, um, then why we are presenting it in the first place? The problem is uh, how to present material that is um, uh, more um, uh, simple and uh, attractive and as we, as we call it chocolate um, uh, coated so people can um, digest it easily 
this is our um, uh, our role to, to do it um, as a science journalist. And this is why um, people are not interested in, in uh, what is presented till now, because they face what um, uh, Andrew was explaining. They think that science is an uh, every power that no one can uh, touch or, or uh, understand. So um, when we first start, uh, when, when I first start our, my career as a science journalist, somebody tell us that um, uh, if you tell the story to your grandma and she understand it, this is the good science story. So, um, but this is what most of the science journalists in the region actually forgot. So um, they keep it complicated, full of jargons, um, and people are not accepting it. Um, and so as media production, so if you uh, presenting um, uh, simple enough uh, um, attractive material to uh, your audience, even the um, editors and the media production will be eager to uh, produce this kind of stories, um, science and health and environment. So um, I think it's a burden on the science journalists themselves to um, introduce attractive and simple material and uh, very life that people can um, digest easily and, and feel interested in. Okay, thank you, Bathaina. Fulgence. Fulgent Sene is the head of translation and editing at uh, Agence Presse Afrique, uh, based in Senegal, and he has been working there for 12 years, more than 12 years now. And uh, APA is uh, one of the largest wire services um, on the continent. So Fulgent, I'd be very interested to hear your reflections on the state of science journalism in Africa. Well, <coughs> so science journalism in, in Senegal First, it de depends. It related, it closely related to the to the level of research in the country. But in Senegal, I can say virtually nothing happens in terms of scientific research. The only experiences I had with uh, research institutions in Senegal are very uh, limited in time and in space. Uh, I can give two examples. One is one uh, uh, a research center, Senegalese research center, private one, uh, that was uh, doing research in, 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 in the ECOWAS community, West African Economic Community, on the use of taxis to reduce the consumption of tobacco products. We had a partnership with the institution and we published all the results they found in the 15 countries of ECOWAS. How can uh, the use of uh, tax increase reduce the number of uh, death, the number of consumers of tobacco product, and thereby, therefore the number of death in Africa. So we published it, but it was just on a, on a on an individual basis. I mean, we have a contract with a company, so we just publish the result, the reports on each countries. But we, just, we, we publish only those results. We have no comment to make. We just write what the, the, um, the research institute wants us to write, because we have no uh, scientific journalism. We were created uh, 12 years ago, so I started working at the inception of the uh, And um, so it's a relatively young uh, agency. The other experience I had with uh, research reporting was the use of local languages by young Senegalese to improve their skills in math and reading. We publish those results, and what we what we what we found is that using local languages is better than using French for young Senegalese. So these are the results. We we publish them raw, like I mean, we have no comment to make, and the the, the institution, the, the research institution, doesn't give us the opportunity to comment because we don't have the experience, the skills, 
and them, they, they too, they don't have communication still, uh, skills. So we, we need to collaborate. We need to know how to publish results. And they know how to disseminate, the, how to make their information easier to digest by common people. Now we need some training in, in terms of uh, uh, reporting, and they need, they also need um, science communication skills. They don't have any, I think. Okay, thank you, Fortunes. Um, I think we have a very rich um, list of, of issues here uh, that you have raised uh, collectively. Um, some of them are, are relatively familiar, like for instance, ideas about what the audience prefer, um, which may or may not be borne out with evidence. I'm very interested, uh, Julie, to come back to, to hear your reflections on this. Um, again, another familiar issue is around mistrust between journalists and researchers. Um, you know, for a group, these are two professional groups that you expect to work very closely together. But actually, it is a notoriously fraught relationship. And sometimes that can be productive and constructive because, you know, it's a kind of investigative, interrogating that you associate with quality journalism. But sometimes it's just stiltifying and, um, and paralyzing. And I think we get lots of examples of that where stuff just doesn't happen. Um, but there, I, I think there are also some really very interesting nuanced reflections around the link between the investment in science and the productivity of science journalism. Um, and I thought in that regard it was very interesting that um, we heard uh, President Mackey talking about the program of investment in Senegal um, and what that might imply for science journalism in Senegal. And so Fulton, I'll come back to you to ask you about that, what you thought about um, his, his reflections. Um, but Julie, I want to start by asking you to reflect on what you've heard from, from some of the other panelists around what the issues might be. Right. Um, I think I'll start with Andy when you're talking about using health indicators to, take, to tell mainstream stories. One of the biggest problems, as I said before, I think is that science is a niche area of reporting, science and health and environment and research. But we need to bring it uh, to center stage. And to do that, we can use health indicators to tell quote-unquote ordinary stories. So I agreed with Andy when he said that. And also about translating um, science, trying to break it down for the ordinary person, trying to make science accessible. For example, at the conversation, that's what we do, We're almost like a translating service. And we work with academics who have research and who have interesting ideas that they've come up with, innovations and creations. And they work with us, a team of journalists, to break that down and make it accessible to a general non-academic audience. And I think that's very important for sharing science with the world. And another good thing about the conversation is that the republishing rate is so high, over 95% of our articles get republished by other media services. And this is meaning that science is now going across Africa and across the world, literally in the in, in a blink of in the blink of an eye? A blink of an eye, that one. <laughs> yeah, so, um, and also about compelling narratives. I think Bothina spoke about that, trying to make science interesting. Try to, try to draw people in. And he also said something about giving science a human face, telling stories about people who are going through things, as opposed to, like Fulgens has just said, uh, republishing results of a scientific study which maybe people who are reading don't even understand. So that also brings in the analysis aspect and the training aspect of science journalists. So when you look at data, you're able to translate it and make, uh, put it into ordinary terms and relate it to ordinary people. Um, then the relationship between, acad not academics, but between scientists and journalists. I think the biggest problem is that the scientists, scientists will come back and say, you quoted me out of context, you didn't understand what I was saying, you're just telling your own story, all this, etc., etc., which comes back again to training. You need to have some understanding of the science that you're reporting. And I'll bring it back to the conversation where we work with academics and, and scientists and professors, and we collaborate with them every step of the way. It's back and forth, back and forth, till the very end. And at the end, they have to approve the story um, to kind of put their stamp on it and say, this is actually what I meant. So that's a missing link in terms of interpreting what science is and journalists having to have some scientific knowledge and scientists having to have some journalistic skills in terms of science communication. 
So it's a very interesting, it's a, it's, it's a field that is probably on the frontier, it's still is about to explode in the sense that now we're having gatherings like this more and more often and bringing different people with different skill sets together. And we might get to that tipping point now where um, everybody is that much more informed and the information about science, environment, health, research can go out that much faster. Okay, I mean, this raises to me two very interesting questions reflecting on, on what you've just said. Um, so one of them is that if a big part of the issue, reflecting on Fulton's experience, is the lack of skills, which in turn leads to a lack of confidence, which might then in turn lead to a lack of production. Um, so that's one big thing, right, as you say, because in fact what you have is then, well, you don't really do it because you don't know, you're not really sure what to do or how to do it. You don't also know how to engage with this kind of sector. You don't really know it and so on. Does that mean that we should be relying, mainstream media should be relying more on science journalists, specialized science journalism media? That's slightly at odds with what Andy was describing. Yeah, yeah I think that's, for the conversation, I think it's actually a very specialized outfit in the sense that we're actually trying to get science out to the people. And we're a one-stop shop. So like a mainstream newspaper in Kenya, for example, like the Standard of the Nation, or in South Africa, like the Star, or even in the UK, like the Sunday Times, if they want to publish, um, if they are looking for a specific type of article that draws from a specific aspect of research, they are likely to find that on the conversation. Yeah, but is that what we are aiming for across the board? Do you see what I mean? Oh. So what I'm saying is actually, because I see how that, how that works in that context. Right. So thinking about it again, linking that up, as you say, with Fulton's experience, should we be doing more of that? Is that something that we should be actively investing in? And I'd like to hear how others feel about that. I mean, David, for instance, as, as you know, in the nation, do you, do, what do you think about the idea about um, working more with specialist uh, outfits that, that, uh, that might have more skills and experience of working with scientists? Um, thank you, Nick. We take a, a multi-pronged approach. One, we recognize that we have our correspondents, our reporters across the country. And across the country, the reporters are general reporters. They don't specialize. Yet in those areas, you find a lot of things that relate to science, health, environment, you can report about. So what do we do? We have training that cuts, uh, cuts across everyone, that every journalist needs not to be a specialist, but have a conscious recognition of scientific stories. So that when you see one, you can contact and then have it as a story to deliver. So that you don't wait that I'm only reporting on politics, Yet in this area alone, I did not report it, national report it. So we do that to help everybody do that. Secondly, we have the specialist who then can uh, uh, take the conversation further. And uh, this uh, um, somehow I'll corner with what uh, my neighbor here was talking about, the ivory, because we have specialized columns. And the reason for that is that there's some stories that lend themselves to extensive na narration. You want a lengthy uh, conversation around it, which requires space, and which you cannot uh, get every day across the news platform. So you have to dedicate a specific day or page for doing that. So we have that also to give people a chance to look at the depth of this. So what I'm saying is that we have multiple approaches to do this. And you asked about um, investment. I think investment must be deliberate that you go out of your way to recognize that this is an area that requires investment, let's put in some money, or let's look at other ways of doing it. An example, um, in Kenya, the medical practitioners are not allowed to advertise. Previously, they were not to advertise for the services. So the occasions when you do a special uh, issue on a particular uh, subject could be uh, medical financing, then you really uh, players who are in that sector to come in and also advertise uh, so that it helps you to advertise up the cost. Okay, I see what you mean. So you're suggesting that in fact in some situations yeah. advertising for science journalism can be constrained because of ethical considerations like the context of medical practitioners. Right. Okay, and that's the particular challenge. I mean, and I know that actually it's a challenging, you know, science journalism is often subject to market failure right. because of again this issue around the specialization. Now I want to talk about um, two very important ideas that have come up. Um, one of them is this idea about the misconception 
of what science journalism is. And I think Bethina explained it. She said, actually, it's not, and Andy inferred this as well, science journalism is not actually about using scientific jargon. It's really actually about breaking it down. Um, how do you respond to that, Idris? I think um, I look at it uh, in two ways. Because when you talk about science journalism, uh, what comes straight to the audience, or that's our listenership, is mostly health stories or agricultural stories, because these are the ones that affect them directly. So for instance, when I talk about the Ebola outbreak, maybe we say there's an Ebola outbreak and we say this is what heart affects you, of course it's listenership will balloon. But to give you an example, uh, we have a space agency in Nigeria, for instance, and uh, at the time they launched a satellite. And people are wondering, I mean, that was Western Point, why, why do you launch a satellite? Uh, I mean, they, 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 they castigated them throughout. I, I, I remember I was running a current affairs program then, and I invited the, the director general of the space agency to come and explain. I think that was one of the lowest uh, uh, listeners I had because they didn't understand what space was all about. But on the other hand, if, you had, if I had carried a program on Ebola or on a yellow fever, I'm sure people understand what you are saying. So I think uh, the problem is people have to uh, be, there's a need to explain. Uh, uh, how a particular technology or a particular science affects the individual at that level. Uh, because in Africa, um, I mentioned this at an earlier uh, gathering, I said uh, the literacy level and the level of poverty are very key. And uh, where people live on less than a dollar a day. And then I come, um, uh, one of the next fellows today was talking about uh, how to use batteries um, um, to, to, to generate power, and then when you take that, for instance, to an audience, they don't understand what you're talking about. Uh -huh. He says that's an elitist thing. He, what he wants to see is how he will see light in his house, not telling him some uh, um, uh, technical jargons on how you will do batteries and uh, conserve some energy through one or two calculations. So I think there's a challenge in, in bringing down most of these uh, scientific uh, innovations and findings to the level of the individual, level of the African, so that you can understand and take ownership uh, of that innovation. But otherwise, uh, it's going to take a long time to be able to, to cultivate that. But for now, I think it's a very big challenge to get people uh, to key into some of this science and technology reporting, except the ones that really uh, affect them. Those are the health issues, agricultural issues, the immediate issues ones to talk about uh, their own needs immediately. And I, I, I have to say that that really resonates with me in many ways, but although I want to, there's one important qualification, so let me tell you a quick story. I, um, I remember going to meet with um, the secretariat of a, a network of development-related NGOs in the UK, and we started talking about science journalism for development. And they said, science for development, that's a really interesting idea. So what would that be? And I thought, seriously? And it was really interesting how they had this notion of what science is, which was quite different from what global development was in practice. And what people then start to do is they start thinking, oh yeah, maybe health, okay, I can see what you mean. Then they say, oh, maybe agriculture, I can see what you mean. But then when you start talking about things like, for instance, even in um, governance, when you start talking about, for instance, crowdsourcing, you know, or of course, if you talk about economic growth, or, you know, so then you start to realize that in fact, Science does affect people's lives in many ways. It's a bit like actually we heard um, President Kagame talking about actually science and tech affecting all of the various priorities. But what I want to go on to talk about, the second thing I want to mention before I invite the, the audience to make a few comments, is are we perhaps approaching this the wrong way around? And we're thinking that science really needs to generate new stories, and that's a way of actually demonstrating its value. But maybe it's not about new stories per se, because actually science is so it's not particularly newsworthy, yes. you know, and that actually, I'm putting it out there, and that actually researchers, when they complain, oh, but you know, you're asking me to do things, to draw conclusions, which are not actually in the interest of good scientific practice, which is incremental, it is tentative, and that does not naturally lend itself to news. And that a, par a better parallel, actually, for science might be to think about art. And when you look at the way art is in the media, you don't normally expect news stories to be art-based. Which is not to say that art does not take up space in our media. 
What do you think about that, Andy? Because I can see you, you're frowning and shaking your head. You can barely contain yourself. Yeah, I, 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 I disagree. I, I really, yes, I, I, a lot of, but science journalism is not just about research. Science is a, journalism is about the way science affects our lives and, and the way it can add substance to a news story so that we're not just talking about generalizations, we can point to specific things. So I, I, I disagree. Yes, I think a lot of research um, is incremental and it's small and we're pushing them and it's not a breakthrough that changes the rest of the world as we know it. Um, and it's just about a flea. But uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, overall, I'd say science, uh, you know, we want to integrate it in, it, it is most useful as it's integrated. Also, what I think is very interesting is if there's controversy. If there is one scientist that says this, and there's another scientist that says, no, that's rubbish, this is the situation. And if you can write about that disagreement, uh, you know, that I think people like to see an argument and they like to see different points of view. No, I agree with you completely. But to me, that's a very good example of a challenge of the newsworthiness of science. Because actually, what you get is this, what they call false balance. And at the moment, there's a lot of angst actually in the science journalism community around climate change because they say that the climate no, science okay, has I'm been presented. Yeah, that. yeah. But I mean, but I know you weren't. But I, I, but this is part of the issue is that they say that you know the way that the stories are presented, you always have to get an opposing side. But actually, the scientific consensus is so overwhelmingly in favor that when you go for an opposing side, you suggest a sense of balance which is not reflected generally. No. But I understand where you're coming from. I mean, you but, know. Can we just hold that? I want to, because we're running out of time, and I do want to open up. We'll come back to this. You're just misrepresenting so. me. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not true, because I allowed you to say that. Um, so did, I, are there people in the audience who might have any questions or comments uh, based on what you've heard so far? Particularly with a view of thinking, actually, okay, if we are serious about pulling together some kind of agenda for action, on what we should be doing to increase the quality and the quantity of science in the media in Africa. These are the kinds of things that we should be thinking about. Okay, so we have two hands. Can I ask you, very, you get up just very quickly, we'll start with the gentleman at the front here, to just say very quickly your name, where you're from, and then to make your comment or question as succinctly as possible, because we are pressed for time. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bendana. I'm a freelance journalist from Uganda. I think, we have to start by getting the right journalists who are interested in science. And uh, by this, like, uh, my own experience is like, you go to a scientific conference, there is a press conference, and after that, the journalists will leave. But mind you, this, like, the conference is taking the whole day. Instead of the journalists spending some time and listening to the scientists, after the press conference, all of them leave. So I think we have to get the right journalists, interest them in learning the best science, science so that they can report from a point of knowledge. But do you not think that they leave because they have deadlines? Let me hear editors up here. It'd be interesting to hear the editors and how they respond to that. Okay, there's a gentleman at the back. Uh, my name is Daniel Yanganyua. I'm from the International Council for Science in of South Africa. Uh, I'm, I'm glad with the discussions happening here. And from, from, the sci I'm from the scientific science side, this is an important discussion which we should follow up. I'm following up on what he said. The journalists come in when the president is there or when the minister is there. <laughs> when these guys left, leave, they also leave. Whatever the scientists are going to discuss day after for two, three, four days, no one is going to report that. So what I'm, I would expect the journalist in terms of science is you should be the people who are standing between the scientists and the society, between the scientists and the policy makers. You should take the scientists in, your, in the respective countries or regions where you are. Bring them down, they should tell you what they are doing why are they doing it? And why should the public care? And why should the government care? If, if, if we come up to that, then we, we will end up having actually the, the people to understand what the scientists are doing. Unfortunately, I don't know what, what, what news worth is, 
But I think understanding what this community is doing and the outcome of, the, of, this, of this workshop is newsworthy. And why do people, why should people understand this? How do they understand it? And I think one of the things I think we should do is we organize a number of workshops and meetings and conferences. And we would want this to be newsworthy. Where do we go? Who do we approach? Do we have in, in Africa or in a region, Southern Africa, Central Africa, a, a community of science journalists? Okay, um, and I'll take one more comment from the guy here. Yeah, okay, and then. Hi, uh, hello everyone. So my name is uh, Thomas Tego. I'm a neuroscientist, and I also run a science uh, news communication portal. Uh, so I guess uh, part of this question I want to ask is, um, we, part of this class was talking about uh, what is newsworthy, I guess, and how are you able to spin the science to make it of interest to people. I guess the question I want to then ask um, is if, if the journalists um, work well with the sciences, which we are pushing for, and the general audience are constantly being supplied with science-relevant information and science-relevant news and are being shown how what is happening in academia connects directly to what happens in their everyday life, don't we believe that this will start generating an appetite for people because it's what they are constantly being fed? Or is this just a theory and I completely misunderstand how news and media works? Okay, and the gentleman just yeah. Okay, Stanley Maposa from the Academy of Science of South Africa. I would like to ask a question from my sister from Combination, which is better to train a scientist to be a communicator or to train a communicator to be a scientist? <laughs> Interesting question. And one more question, then we will have to stop. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Shannon, I'm originally from Mauritius, and I'm currently a facilitator at the I can't hear the yeah. mic very well, is it? Yeah. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, so the question has to do with basic science research, right? So you've mentioned that there is this need to show the public how um, the science that is being done impacts them in their lives. And so I want to bring up you know, an example right now. Let's say, for instance, the discovery of um, bead shells in the Blombos Cave in South Africa. That was an important discovery because that then put you know, artistic endeavors right here on the continent. Um, so would you say that something like that would appeal to, to an African audience? Um, or is it that the only science that people will care about is science that you know, changes something about the way they lead their lives? So is science that changes minds also interesting to the public? And how do we report on that? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, this is some really interesting questions, I think, um, quite profound in, in terms of their impact. What I'm gonna suggest, uh, and I'm giving you a heads up so you can think about it, is that um, you pick a question that you want to respond to, but I also want you to identify at least one priority action that you think would be important to increase the quality and or quality of science coverage in Africa, okay? So you can respond to one of the questions and I'm happy to remind you. Um, and I'd, I'd yes. Like the, the question that um, the guy here asked about, uh, would you train the communicator to be a scientist or a scientist to be a communicator? And actually, you have to train both. <laughs> Um, the problem is um, if you have an uh, untrained uh, journalist with a shallow background on science, you will have a very bad um, uh, uh, science journalist. And on the other way, if you have a scientist who is not trained enough to be uh, communicable, uh, so you will not be able to report about his science. So it's sophisticated. But um, what I would um, uh, think of that um, actually in my region, scientists are a bit um, uh, step over um, uh, journalists. If they are not going to be um, uh, eager enough and they will be covering science, actually uh, the trend is now that 
uh, some of the scientists do their own vlogger to uh, go straight to the audiences. So if the journalists are not there and take care of their career, they will not be found a career of science journalists anymore because scientists are now eager to have this kind of science communication skills uh, more better and um, with social media, they are um, uh, tipping over and, and going directly to the audiences. Um, but the problem is uh, also science uh, journalism have a role here to uh, keep everybody connected, not just scientists with communication skills who are available to go directly to the audiences. Um, and writing an action, I think, um, uh, I think in our um, career as science journalism, not just training is a problem. Um, I, I had a lot of training. I, I see a lot of journalists who, who go through training, but the, the, this didn't change much of, of how um, uh, proper their skills are. Um, so I think the, the, the main issue here is to have mentoring uh, periods that a journalist can go through, uh, have a mentor, um, an experienced jo science journalist who can um, uh, just uh, instruct you in the start and make sure that you are going in the straight, in the right way, you are uh, targeting your audiences in the right way, you are structuring your stories well, you are attracting people to your stories in a right direction. So I, I think mentoring is the answer. Um, okay, thank you. Okay, so we have, you've responded to one question and you've provided us with one key action, you think, going forward. Fulgence, I can yeah. see that you're bursting. Yeah. <laughs> I would like to um, add to the comment by the freelance journalist. He said that uh, we should have the right journalists. And the other guy said uh, a journalist should be between the community and the, the scientific uh, world. Uh, I, I hope I'm not... Uh, making any much more heavy weight on, 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 on journalists because I think a, a journalist, the right journalist should be not only the scientific journalist should be not only a reporter but he should be a social worker he should he should be um, he should have communication skills I mean what, what kind of language he has to, to give to, 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 to the common public. In Senegal, we have that problem. 70% of the population is illiterate. How can a journalist reach these communities without using maybe their, their local languages? How can they reach these benefic supposed beneficiaries of scientific research? So uh, the right journalist is someone who is important, a scientist, uh, kind of, uh, between, uh, in brackets, and a social worker. He needs to be the perfect link between the scientific community and the beneficiaries. Okay, so what would be your um, key action my, if we want to know increase my, science journalism in Africa? Yeah. To increase, uh, I mean, to, to strengthen the level of training of journalists and uh, to to help them have language communication skills. In Senegal, we have 25 local languages based on regional. How can we, uh, we should train people to, to, to um, focus on certain local languages. Of course, Wolof is the most spoken language in Senegal, but you have others that don't speak Wolof at all. No, I hear your point. I mean, uh, Agenda 2030 says leave no one behind. I take your point. That's, yeah, a, that's yeah. a major challenge as a communicator. Yeah. Okay, so that, that was, there's mostly a, a financial or economic aspect of it. Mm -hmm. My news agency is private. It is private, and they they invested it in this media media to to make profit. Now, how can it manage to disseminate information? And get profit from, from 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 its daily 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 job. So this also is a 
you know, it's a challenge actually that many science, many journalism outfits face um, globally. Um, it's uh, particularly interesting if you are focused on a particular sector as a journalism outfit. So I, I hear what you're saying. I, I empathize entirely. Okay, next. Who wants to take on the next question and next? Julie? Yeah. Okay, go on. Um, the question about can we create an appetite for science stories, and I think we absolutely can. And the, the way to do that is in the way we tell the story. It's about storytelling. How do you present that information? For example, at the workshop we had on Sunday, there were scientists who were uh, working with machine intelligence. And what they're doing is teaching machines to speak an actual language like English. And I found that such an interesting story. But if you present it to an editor as, oh, I met this scientist who's working with machines and they're becoming intelligent and all this kind of thing, artificial intelligence, it doesn't translate that fast. But if you say, I met a scientist who wants to teach a machine to speak my language and to respond to me beyond a yes or no or a 1A or 1B answer, then that is a story. That's an interesting thing that will grab people's attention. So in terms of creating an appetite, we absolutely can. We, it's just a matter of how we frame this information, how we draw people in, and if we do it regularly consistent and consistently. In terms of a priority action, get to the gatekeepers like we are up here, the editors and convince them that um, there's, there's newsworthiness in science. Um, science is not, we should, don't put it in a corner, don't send a baby to the corner. Have you watched that movie? Yeah. <laughs> Dirty dancing. Um, science but, is baby, yes. Yeah, science is baby. It's just to get to the people who make these decisions on a daily basis. I'll give, an, I'll give you an example. I used to edit the Sunday magazine, which was basically a magazine for women. And as the editor, I could put anything in that magazine. But looking back, I think I maybe did maybe four or five science stories in a 12 month period, and unacceptable, right? But after being exposed to this um, forum and meeting all these scientists, I see that there's so many stories to tell about science that's happening every day, and there's so much research that Africans are doing that needs to be communicated. So another thing, another action point perhaps, is exposing us. Like forums like these just open your eyes to the possibilities, and they're endless. Thank you, Julie. Um, okay, Idris, you get to go next. So question first. From, from the audience, and then your key action. Okay, can I go ahead? Yeah, yeah, go on. Uh, okay, um, at the presidential panel uh, that just ended uh, some few hours ago, uh, President Kagame said something. Uh, he said, uh, let me just paraphrase, that uh, maybe he doesn't have the acumen or the, to be a Zuckerberg, but he's willing to provide the environment, uh, the space to create more Zuckerbergs, for instance. So I think the key is the will not only from the journalists themselves, but from all the stakeholders, because the journalists themselves alone, saying they will encourage science reporting, will not go anywhere. Uh, uh, Fulgen just talked about his AFP now, a API. People established it to make money. And uh, at the end of the day, that's the bottom line. So even if you want to encourage science reporting, and they feel that that science reporting will not bring the resources, tendency is for the proprietor to say, please concentrate on the things that will bring me money for me to break even. Then, the scientists too must also have the will and the audience. If you put the science stories and the audience aren't willing to listen, as the scientists said, uh, for now, research shows that people are more interested in things that they think affect them directly. What they think will not affect them directly, they give little or scant attention to. So I think it's, it must be a multifaceted approach involving both the journalists, the scientists, and then trying to uh, maybe increase literacy among even the Afri uh, among most of us Africans because let's face it, the literacy is very low, and uh, most of the sciences you report they don't understand. Idris, I want to come back to you on that though because in a way it almost sounds I'm not suggesting this is what you're doing, but it almost sounds like you're saying, oh well, you know the responsibility is divert this fuse and it's everywhere. So when you start talking about increasing the industry across Africa, no, no. so okay, yeah, we get this, but what would you, as an editor, and I, I think Julie's example is really uh, apropos, you as an editor do to make a difference here? Because I think you give a very good example of, okay, you make a decision, because we know reality, we talk about proprietors, and we know what we're talking about is editors, right? Yeah. What, yeah, okay. Yes, as an editor, I think uh, the first step is to try to humanize whatever story that you have, because we are trying to connect to the listeners. So if, if you cannot humanize 
whatever invention, whatever story, whatever science story uh, that is there, uh, like uh, uh, Andrew was talking about uh, mortality rates uh, in Mali, whether it's going up or come down. So whatever science is involved in that, you must be able to humanize it for people to understand. I think as an editor, is to get those under you, either as reporters or couple reporters, to humanize whatever science story, whatever science invention, whatever a scientist tells them. That way you can directly uh, impact uh, to the people. I think so humanizing is very important. Okay. I, I mean, I think what's interesting about what Andy was saying is he's saying you, on, on one hand, you're humanizing the science to make the story, but you're also scientizing the story. Right, so you have your story and you find a way to bring the science into it. Um, Andy, okay, since you're nodding, why don't you think we save, David, we save you uh, for last. Okay. So, um, yes, you have a, 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 a question or comment that you might yes. want to respond yes, to and then was, a priority. There, there yeah. was the question um, at the end about uh, <clears throat> beads being found uh, uh, in, 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 amongst archeological bones and indicating uh, you know, the, the, the relevance of that is it's indicating a level of trade uh, with Africa or, and a level of, of in industry that uh, in prehistory. Uh, uh, and I, 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 that's what one thing I really like to use uh, in, in science stories, in my stories, is to show that Africa um, has a long and a rich history. And uh, it, it has not, it, it has not been someplace that has been uh, you know, a, a backwater. It has actually always been connected with the rest of the world. Um, and uh, we're talking about in Africa, but particularly writing for an international news agency, it is gratifying for me to be able to say there is science going on in Africa and it's important science and look at uh, all of this. And the, uh, the one suggestion yeah. that I have, I would like to see more uh, African science writing with an audience of children to reach young people and show them what how science impacts on their lives here in Africa. Now, one thing that I saw that was really amazing that I think is Black Panther. I mean, how many young people are going to see that movie and they're going to see women who are t the technologists who are saying, here's the science, here's what we can do, and now you're in a car that floats through the air. But, uh, you know, and, and I think that movie can do, a, that one of the things that's so refreshing is it put Africa in a positive light and also it put women and Africans in science. And I think that can help change young people to say, oh, I want to do that. I can say that AP just happened to publish a story about where you can find Wakanda in okay. real Africa. <laughs> okay. um, David, last word, and I, it's also have to, going to have to be a quick word because we've gone over a bit, but I know we started late, but um, I don't want us to, to abuse our, um, people's time. So. Okay, thank you, Nick. A question was asked by Daniel about journalists following politicians. I want to say that is the bane of journalism. Uh, journalists have that tendency, and um, it's a challenge as editors we keep facing. And uh, the way we seek to approach it is through proper briefing of journalists. That wherever you go for a conference, the politician may just be leaving a, a script written to, for him or her, but you know the origin of the ideas. Look for the scientists within the hall who will be able to tell you the details. Um, a suggestion, we have to mainstream science reporting. Have it as a daily item in a news menu, so that uh, every other time we look at new um, innovations, whatever happens in our environment, and see how we bring it to our audiences, and in a way that they can relate with. What can we do to incentivize that? Should we set up like an award or something? You know, well, something that would get jerk because basically you are editors, so you know, right? But do you um, get people to then want to mainstream it in view of the structural challenges? I, I'm an editor who hates awards. Why? It creates journalists who write for that particular award. They don't do journalism. Okay, enough said. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I want to, um, to thank um, the Next Line Time Forum for, for ha having the space and having the, 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 this event here. Of course, I want to thank the, the panel for, um, for, for being so generous with their, their experiences and their thoughts. Um, I want to thank um, you, the audience, for, for taking the time to come along. And of course, I want to thank um, SciDev and, and the Bosch Foundation um, for supporting to, today's event. And 
by extension supporting script, which as I said has been the inspiration around this, this panel. Thank you. Thank you.